Welcome to Around Town. I'm Leah Haslidge. On today's episode, we get an update on pickup and drop off procedures at Cleveland Hopkins International Airport. We'll witness Cleveland Division of Fire promotion ceremonies in City Hall. And then we'll check in at the Hilton Hotel in downtown for the 15th annual Cleveland Go Red for Women Expo. Don't go anywhere. Around Town will be right back, only right here on TV20. We are Cleveland. Hey Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Do clouds take naps? I couldn't tell you. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! Roll over. Can't high five. All right. When you adopt a shelter pet, you discover all the things that make them unique. And your mother and... Her. I am totally a hot person. Right, guys? Thanks for being honest. They're a little bit of a lot of things, but they're all pure love. Adopt pure love at theshelterpetproject.org. Welcome back to Around Town. Good morning, thank you for uh, being here with us. And thank you whoever made the decision that we should be inside and not outside doing this. Um, I, I want to put in context and make the point of why is it that we're here having this discussion. And we're here having this discussion this morning because of the good things that are happening at Cleveland Hopkins International Airport. More airlines are flying here, more flights are flying in and out of Cleveland, more passengers are using this terminal building, and because of the change in the profile of that passenger, not someone getting off a plane, walking down a concourse to get on another plane, but rather an origination person that's getting coming to Hopkins to get on a plane to fly someplace puts it is putting a strain not only on this ticketing lobby in our current facilities but on the ingress egress drop off and pick up locations at, at Hopkins Airport um, two factors have come into play that uh, will are resulting in the uh, implementation of changes and modifications in that pickup and drop off that Director Kennedy will explain in a second. And both of them are, are construction related. The one that was most immediate was this uh, upper roadway outside of this terminal is, is to have uh, an expansion joint capital project uh, improvement commence. That's a three month process that'll take place. We were looking to start that project now in March, having it done well before the international visitors come to Cleveland for the uh, baseball all-star game. But it turns out that the fabrication work that's needed for that project by itself will take 10 weeks. Therefore, if we started construction at the conclusion of 10 weeks, that would be a construction zone by in uh, July when the All-Star Game would start. So we are pushing back the commencement of that project till later in July, around August the August the 1st. The second project that's going to take place is is relative to the Ground Transportation Center, and and again a, a multi-million dollar project, an improvement to enhance the uh, the uh, quality of the experience for our passengers that will use that facility. But again, we'll be able to accelerate what should be a one-year construction project and not have our passengers using Hopkins be navigating through a construction zone by just shutting it down and allowing that project to take place uh, and, and get to a completion in hopefully uh, a lot less than a one-year period of time. So that's the context of, of why we re are here the uh, variables that came into play that have necessitated us to modify the pickup drop-off system here at Hopkins. And I'm very pleased to uh, uh, present uh, Director Kennedy to you, who will uh, outline the uh, phasing of the uh, changes that are taking place. Thank you, Chief. Good morning. Welcome to Cleveland Hopkins International Airport. I'm Robert Kennedy, the director, as the Chief said. And yes, I'll go over the particulars of the phasing that we're going to do 
on the immediate changes to the ground transportation pickup and drop off locations. Plus, I'm going to give a little detail of why things changed at the airport uh, since our original planning and process here. So first, on the 18th, it was announced that we will begin phasing back uh, some pickup and some um, drop off at the terminal frontage road. That will be for li uh, private car limousine, not just private cars. Private cars have always been welcome at the at the ter at the uh, curb front, uh, but also Uber, Lyft, those transportation network uh, companies will be going to the upper and lower uh, roadway systems. Uh, after that move occurs, three days later. Uh, we will move the taxis from the garage in the ground transportation center back to where they were originally, uh, which is on the south baggage level. And then by March 1st, we will move the shuttles, which have been in the ground transportation center uh, since 2015 uh, for the construction for the facade and so forth here, will go to our north uh, uh, baggage level, north baggage level. Uh, there's more construction signage and so forth that has to be done, but this will allow us to take that entire area that is currently uh, the ground transportation, uh, uh, currently the ground transportation center, uh, and without having the passengers to go through there, as the chief explained, and we can accelerate the uh, construction phase. This year, our forecast is for 10.1 million annual passengers here, with 96 percent of those coming through the front door over there. Next year, we'll probably have over 10.5 million or 10.7 million annual passengers. So we need to accelerate how rapidly we can uh, virtually expand the terminal. We're not expanding the terminal or making those terminal decisions until our master plan is done, and that's a two-year process. We talk about the forecasting and the number of people that we expect through here, and that's not just be, not a guess. That we look at the advanced schedules of the airlines. We had planned on one uh, one number from the airlines, and when I, we got our advanced schedules uh, for the rest of this year, it was more than double that. So we needed to make sure that we're preparing. We're doing the phasing. Um, which this had to be done at some point in these projects. We can do this now uh, so that we're, uh, we're prepared for the Major League uh, All-Star Game. And then when we, after that is over, we can do the construction on the upper roadway and begin the construction on the ground transportation center. This was always part of the phasing, but it just for our circumstances for fabrication, for the passenger numbers, we had to accelerate it a bit. So uh, we hate to uh, start a program and have to back up and do something different. However, airports are dynamic environments. Passengers, airlines, circumstances that are not even related to Cleveland contribute to the way that we must adapt and we must apply uh, any adaption out there in the marketplace. And uh, with that, that's all I've got to say. Uh, Michelle, you questions? Questions, guys? How big of a role did the traveler feedback play the travelers who are having to go to the garage to catch taxis? Well, always, we, uh, for years, for more than a decade, uh, this airport has been gathering every quarter feedback from the, the, our guests here, not only on ground transportation, but amenities, air service, all of those things to improve it. I called dozens of the people that gave feedback myself. As I said, this was part of our eventual phasing for the ground transportation, so we had an opportunity to bring them back in a short period. So, always valuable, but not the most driving force in this. When will construction on the new ground transportation center begin, and what will that include on its well, we're uh, finishing our evaluations of the RFPs as a design build, which is an accelerated process. Uh, we are not under contract yet because we haven't gone through negotiations on the successful uh, proponent. Uh, that will start on the 20th of February. 
And so once we have a contract, uh, we're planning on a 10 to 12 month uh, period of construction. So to give you a start stop date, I don't have it because I haven't negotiated that yet. What will that ground transportation center include? Key, key to this all along, and uh, we've said this numerous times, is that what we have over there is not the passenger experience or guest experience that we wish. It's not. Has not. Is not. What we're going to add is some canopies to protect from the weather, uh, more lighting, islands, pavement, uh, um, uh, lighting heaters, all of this to improve the experience. And we have a couple of other things that we're experimenting or uh, uh, reviewing now, uh, amenity enhancements that uh, we uh, hope to employ by the time we open that. And I'll just leave it at that one. Why did the airport move taxis to the garage just a month ago if now we're being moved back to the curbside? Well, we needed to move taxis to provide a place for the uh, limousines and the Ubers and the Lyfts to drop off. Because if you look at the the, um, the number of trips, taxis are about 25,000 trips per year, and uh, Uber, Lyft, all of those guys are well over um, 600, 700,000 trips per year. So it was a, it was a simple math about uh, the logistics of moving people uh, as close as we could without uh, congesting uh, the terminal roadway. So, but I guess I'm asking what's changed in the last month since that was moved to the garage and now it's been moved back to the garage. Oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, I thought I explained earlier. Uh, two. Two things have happened. One is the chief said the construction uh, information about fabrication uh, on the on the expansion joints on the north deck. Second thing was um, the fact that as we looked at phasing on the ground transportation center, there was a decision that the best customer experience or guest experience was not to have a phased approach to the ground transportation center which meant we would probably do one-third, 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 which makes it difficult for our guests. We made the decision based upon what we forecast in passenger activity uh, this year and next year to go ahead and accelerate that over there. So it became a numbers game of how can we make it the best we can now and then being prepared for those additional numbers in the future. We're back to 2009, 2008 levels of passenger uh, traffic here, which is a, 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 a great story. I know airport managers across this country would love to be in this predicament. However, we have a terminal facility that was built and designed uh, prior to 9-11. And so we have to accommodate as much as we can until our master plan comes forward with our next quarter century plan. Good morning. Uh, today we'll be swearing in, um, not swearing in, but promoting uh, five uh, individual, uh, one from lieutenant to captain and four from firefighter to lieutenant, okay? Uh, what we'll do is we'll do the captain as uh, one to captain. We'll do that uh, uh, as an individual, and then I'll read uh, the bios of each of the lieutenants, uh, and then we'll do that as a group. So first we have uh, Lieutenant Michael Hendricks. Is Hendrick? Hendricks, yes, sir. Hendricks. Uh, Mr. Hendricks was appointed to the Division of Fire in 2001. He was promoted to lieutenant in 2013. He recently served on Engine 7, Battalion 5 Rover, Battalion 6 Rover, and Engine 4. In 1987, he graduated, uh, was a graduate of St. Ignatius uh, High School. Mr. Hendricks also is a graduate of Michigan State University with a bachelor uh, degree. He has received two uh, certificates of appreciation in 2001 and another in 2008. Are you ready, sir? Yes. All right. Okay, if you could raise your right hand, repeat after me. I state your name. I state my name. Okay. 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 Ok
Scott Michael Hendricks. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. I will support the Constitution of the United States. And I will support the Constitution of the United States. The laws and Constitution of the State of Ohio. The laws and Constitution of the State of Ohio. The ordinance and charter of the City of Cleveland. The ordinance and charter of the City of Cleveland. Uh, faithfully. I'll faithfully. Honestly. Honestly. And impartially. And impartially. Discharge the duties of. Discharge the duties of. Captain of Fire. Captain of Fire. For the State of Ohio. The State of Ohio. During my continuance in said office. In my, during my continuance of said office. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I'll read the bio of um, the next four, and then we'll swear them all in at uh, one time. Uh, Mr. James, Timothy James Mc, McMara? McNamara. McNamara, sorry. Mr. McNamara was appointed to the Division of Fire in 1994. He most recently uh, served with the Fire Dispatch Center, Engine 33, and Ladder 30. He graduated from Lakewood High School in 1973 and attended Cleveland State University, earning a degree in Business Administration in 1983. Uh, Mr. McNamara has received two letters of appreciation. Next, we have Stephen Michael Churchin. Um, Mr. Churchin was appointed to the Division of Fire in 1996. He's most recently served with Ladder 23, Engine 38, and Ladder 1. He's a graduate of Olmsted Falls High School. Mr. Christopher Clark uh, Camargin, Camargin yes, uh, was appointed to the Division of Fire in 2000. He recently, uh, his recent assignments include serving with the Bears unit, uh, Ladder 36 and Engine 36. He's a graduate of Cardinal High School. And finally, we have Mr. Raymond Edward Ruffin. Mr. Ruffin was appointed to the Division of Fire in 1998. His uh, most recent assignments include serving with Engine 7, Engine 13, and Ladder 39. He's a graduate of JFK High School, and he obtained an associate's degree from Cuyahoga Community College. Are you ready, gentlemen? Okay. Could you raise your right hand and repeat after me? I state your name. Do solemnly swear. Do swear. I'll support the Constitution of the United States. I support the Constitution of the United States. The laws and Constitution of the State of Ohio. Laws and Constitution of the State of Ohio. The codified ordinance and charter of the city. Of Cleveland. And I will honestly, faithfully, and impartially discharge the duties of Lieutenant of Fire of the State of Ohio during my continuance in said office. Congratulations. Today is a great day, and I am proud of you, very proud. Good morning, and thanks for joining us today in the Mayor's Red Room. I am Fire Chief Angelo Cavillo. I want to thank the Honorable Mayor Frank G. Jackson, um, Safety Director Michael McGrath, Assistant Director Tim Hennessy, Division of Fire Command Staff, City Council Safety Committee Chair Matt Zone, Councilman Martin Kane, other elected officials, representatives from our safety forces, Firefighters Local 93, the promotional candidates, family and friends. Today is a great day for the Division of Fire as we acknowledge and promote these lieutenants and captain. I want to thank everyone for coming today to be a part of this ceremony. Lieutenants and captains, you worked hard and hours of preparation led to your selection for promotion. 
We are confident in our choice. Always remember you are a civil servant and have taken an oath of office to serve the citizens and visitors of Cleveland, Ohio. Serve them with professionalism and compassion. You have earned your position as officers on the Cleveland Division of Fire. There are many people counting on you and rooting for your success. The honor brings the expectation that you will be responsible, reliable, and accountable. A fire officer is the team leader, guiding and directing those in their command. Lead with courage and commitment. Lead by example. To the family members of the promoted officers, I want to thank you for all the support and guidance you have provided your loved ones here today. They would not be here without that support. Thank you. From this day forward, your new rank means you are held to a higher standard each and every day. Be respectful, be professional, be a leader, and always, always be safe. Congratulations to our new Cleveland Fire Lieutenants and Captains. May God bless you and protect you all. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mayor Frank Jackson. You've probably seen media coverage of the growing opioid epidemic in Northeast Ohio. But what you might not know is how many of these tragedies begin with a seemingly innocent prescription for pain medication. That is why we're teaming with the Cuyahoga County Opiate Marketing Task Force to encourage you to know the risk. Go to the website on your screen to learn which pills are opiates, and alternative ways of dealing with pain, which starts as a prescription can end with addiction, so know the risk. The American Heart Association and University Hospitals hosted the 15th annual Cleveland Go Red for Women Expo and Luncheon at the Hilton Hotel in downtown Cleveland. We've been together for 15 years and we're going to announce today another three years. So soon enough we're going to be 18 together with American Heart. Uh, I am uh, not from Cleveland, I came here 12 years ago with Dr. Simon. We established the Heritage Heart and Vasco Institute, and it's been every year uh, growing interest. We established the Women's Center for Heart Health. Uh, that is going to be our biggest investment this year in trying to prevent heart disease for women every day. The event stresses the importance of being heart healthy and knowing the symptoms of a heart attack. Most people relate chest pain as a classic symptom of a heart attack. Most heart attacks don't come that way. And women pretty much don't feel that symptom. They may feel jaw, they may feel even headaches that might be associated with that. So the biggest point for us is that women, as they age, they should check with their primary care physicians if they have any risk factors and then take care of those risk factors because prevention of overall is the most important thing that we can do. Attendees had an opportunity to speak with medical professionals, purchase merchandise, enter raffles, get massages, and learn CPR. Today we're here to show people um, CPR, basically how important it is to learn CPR and the importance of an AED. So in the event a friend or family member goes down, you are equipped with all the knowledge to uh, get them hopefully back alive before paramedics like me get there. Push hard, push fast. Just that simple. You know, don't wait, push hard, push fast, call 911, and get guys like me on the way to come relieve you. We walked in, and uh, the first thing we did was CPR. And I was telling my oldest she wants to be, you know, a, a babysitter, and you have to know that. And even, even Delaney did it. So I, just the importance of that, 
which was a huge deal. They do it in school now, where they teach the students. And just knowing to keep healthy, stay active, which they both are, and just take care of yourself, you know, and that's, that's what this is about. So I'm super happy to be here. Dr. Judith Mackle of University Hospitals also finds it important that younger generations learn CPR and is working to make it mandatory in schools. I'm really excited uh, about the initiative to have CPR as a graduation requirement for high school in Ohio. What made you want to push the high schoolers knowing CPR? So the survival from out of hospital sudden cardiac death is about 15%. With the institution of bystander CPR and uh, portable defibrillators in the field, we can get a survival rate of about 35 to 40 percent, which is amazing. And it's so important in the first few minutes after the cardiac arrest that somebody starts CPR, that just having more people know how to do it increases the chances that you'll survive. So we're just making Ohio a very safe state and we're helping people survive cardiac arrest, and I think it's terrific. What do you think women should know about heart health? Well, I think women, certainly when this event started, it was to try to get women to recognize that they too can have heart disease, because we used to always think of it as a male disease. But it turns out that women get it just as frequently, that we die of heart disease just as frequently, and there's so much that we can do for ourselves and for our loved ones that really can change our outcomes. So women need to take their heart health seriously. Heart disease is the number one killer in women, isn't it? It is. And all the choices that we make, including what kind of food we eat, how much exercise we get, what we feed our families and children, we really are quite powerful in deciding our health and our family's health. So it's really important to think about. What do you hope people take away from this event? Well, I hope they have fun. I hope they do a little introspection about what they might do themselves, see a doctor, change their diet, change their exercise habits, um, quit smoking. Uh, so I think there's a lot, just, just spending a day where you hear about heart disease and sea survivors, I think is very inspiring. For more information, visit ahacleveland.org.